Thank you to uh, the PC and the organizers for including this program uh, paper on the program. Uh, I'm Malesh Pai. I'm a researcher. I'm a professor at Rice University and a researcher at Special Mechanisms Group. Uh, this is joint work with Max Resnick and uh, Elijah Fox, who isn't here. All right. So, uh, what's uh, sort of the motivating um, question in this paper? Well, it's censorship resistance. And traditionally, when uh, blockchain people talk about censorship resistance, they're concerned about stuff like OFAC. So, the idea that maybe a transaction who uh, touches certain addresses that OFAC has sanctioned or some other government regulatory body has sanctioned, uh, the people uh, involved, builders, proposers, people like that, won't include these transactions on the chain because they're concerned of regulatory pressure. But censorship resistance is not just about eventual inclusion, not just the idea that valid transactions should get onto uh, the uh, chain at some point. It also requires timely inclusion. So being viable as a platform to do things like DeFi requires that as far as possible or as far as practicable, practicable a transaction should get onto the chain when it's uh, put out there. So this paper tries to uh, get at that question by providing an economic definition of censorship resistance and uh, gives you uh, some results on how censorship resistance or the lack thereof implement, uh, impacts the ability to conduct certain mechanisms we might want to conduct on chain. In particular, we're going to look at auctions. Why auctions? Well, A, we're auction theorists. But B, uh, auctions are a primitive for a whole bunch of price discovery mechanisms. So think DeFi liquidations, think MEV recapture, think uh, you know, enshrined PBS. We want to move all these things on chain. Okay, And um, Here's sort of a motivating example, just a really simple thing. So suppose I sell you a contract. So I write a contract with you that's just a standard European call option. That means that I tell you at block X, I will pay you the positive difference between the price of Ethereum during that block and some strike price P that we've agreed upon. The catch is that to exercise this option, you have to submit a transaction in block X. So if the price of Ethereum at that block is above P, you have to say, hey, Malaysia, time to pay up. Now, suppose this block comes around and the price of uh, Ethereum has indeed gone up. So it's gone up to P plus 10. That means that you're willing to pay up to $10 in priority fees to include the transaction. That means anything up to $10, if it costs you to include that transaction, you're willing to pay it because you'll get 10 minus whatever you pay in uh, priority fees. The trouble is, I know that the moment that transaction gets on chain, I'm toast. I'm, I'm stuck owing you $10, so I'm willing to pay up to $10 to censor your transaction. And if you follow that logic, then of course, the equilibrium price of inclusion must be roughly 10. That is, the gains from, transact, uh, gains from contracting have to go as a priority fee, uh, because either I'm willing to pay to um, censor you, or you're willing to pay to get it included. And then the question is, if the gains from transacting are going to the proposer, why smart contract or DeFi in the first place? All the gains are going away to the proposer. So that's sort of the motivating uh, question. To make progress on this, we need a formal definition. And uh, there's a two-part definition. So first, we need to we want to abstract away from the machinations of a specific chain or a specific kind of mechanism. And we'll define what we call a public bulletin board. So a public bulletin board just does two things. You can read stuff that's on the public bulletin board, and that's free, and that can always be done. But you can write stuff to the public bulletin board, and the write command takes two things. It takes a message M and an inclusion uh, tip T, and returns, M, uh, returns one if the message is indeed written to the public bulletin board, and returns zero if, it fails being, if that message fails being written at that tip T. So for a single block, for example, the write up, if, if your public bulletin board, uh, board is a single block, then that write transaction fa uh, succeeds if you manage to write that message into that block. It fails if you don't manage to write that message into that block. If your public bulletin board is a sequence of k uh, consecutive blocks, then it succeeds if it writes to any one of those blocks, fails otherwise. Now, what's our definition of censorship resistance? The censorship resistance of a public bulletin board is a mapping from the tip to a number, which is the cost that it would cost an adversary to include, uh, sorry, uh, to cause the right operation to fail. So, fee of t is the amount it costs the adversary 
to cause the right, right operation to fail. That is to say that phi of t is a measure of the uh, censorship resistance of that public, uh, public bulletin board. And intuitively, you want to make phi of t as large as possible to try and make sure that uh, motivated adversaries would have to pay a lot to keep stuff off chain. So just going back to our example, if you have um, a single block, then the adversary has to compensate the proposer as much as they would, uh, it would take for them to, uh, as much as the tip that they would have gotten for including, so phi of t equals t. Now, if instead your transaction fee mechanism has something like a burn, like current Ethereum uh, with the IP1559, if the current burn is b, then phi of t is the larger of t minus b and zero. With multiple blocks, on the other hand, so the burn sort of reduces the censorship resistance of, a, uh, of uh, the blockchain. With multiple blocks, the censorship resistance goes up. So if you have k different, if you're doing multiple blocks with k different proposers, then you have to pay each of them to keep uh, the thing off chain. So with a tip t, the censorship resistance is k time t for a k block system. And I have un undone my laces, so if I fall flat, that's, that's the comedy section of this. Uh, Okay, so what is, how does censorship resistance interact with, um, interact with uh, running the auction on chain? So we're going to consider the a traditional uh, private values auction. That means there are uh, a single seller, single good for sale. There are n plus one buyers of the good, and I want specifically n plus one because my buyer zero is going to have a very designated meaning. Each of these buyers is going to have a value, and just think of this value as being drawn IID from uniform zero one. Now in an ideal world, the seller would announce the auction, the buyers would submit the bids, and uh, the winner in the payment would be determined according to the auction rules. But when the auction is on chain, the bidders may submit these bids, but some of these bids may not be included. And the auction is executed only on the included bids on chain. So what's the censorship game we want to study? The, sense, the seller is going to announce an auction. In particular, we're going to imagine they announce a uh, second price seal bid auction with the reserve price R. And to begin with, let's just imagine they sell it over a single block. The buyers are going to learn their values. And N of our buyers are honest, what we call honest buyers. That means they're not trying to do anything funky. They just go ahead and submit their bid, BI, with an associated tip, TI. So, uh, and, and we'll make the assumption that their bids are private. So the bids are not observed, but the tips that are associated with the bids are observed. Now, buyer zero is what we call a censoring bidder. So buyer zero is kind of like the adversary in our model. Buyer zero understands the game a little bit better, understands that keeping these other buyers' um, uh, bids off the chain can only improve or can potentially improve their life outcomes by keeping away some competitive bids. So what they do is they observe all the tips, TI, and then they can offer the proposer of the block a take it or leave it offer. That is to say they can go, and go ahead to the proposer and say, here's a subset of the bids that you, are going, you have received. You can see them in the mempool. Here is a bribe P, and if you want, take my bribe P and keep these uh, subset S of the bids um, off the, uh, keep, keep this subset uh, off the block. They also can submit their own bid B0. The proposer now has a choice. They see all the tips and bids that have been submitted. They also see the bribe, and they can choose whether to include all the bids or take the bribe and include only the subset of the bids. The auction is going to run only on the bids that are included in the block. And our purpose here is to just study what happens in this game, how does this game play out, given that there is this uh, buyer who can, um, who can do this kind of censoring activity. OK, so uh, I want to spend most of my time uh, just, just walking you through what happens with two bidders. So there's a bidder one who's like this honest bidder who, uh, and I don't mean, I mean, they're still strategic but they're not trying to do any censoring. And what they're going to do, because it's a second price auction, it's a dominant strategy to submit your bid truthfully. So they're going to submit a bid B. But they also have a choice of how much to tip. And when choosing how much to tip, they have to trade off between if they tip a lot, then that's money that they're losing regardless of whether or not they win the auction. Conversely, if they tip too little, it makes it really cheap for the uh, censoring bidder to see that the tip is low and say, hey, it's cheap enough to me to buy out. 
So what you can show is that they uh, solve this particular equation and uh, tip as a function of that. Now, a cute uh, feature of this equilibrium is that this tip is increasing in the bid, uh, increasing in the value. So what that means is that even though buyer zero does not observe buyer one's bid, in equilibrium, it can back out what buyer one's uh, bid must be from the fact that they're tipping optimally. What is buyer zero strategy? Well, buyer zero sees the tip, and buyer zero understands that, hey, if I bribe the bidder more than the, uh, more than the tip, uh, bribe the proposer more than the tip, then I win the auction for free because there's no one else sitting there. That other, uh, that other uh, bidder is gone. Or I can just choose to stay out of the auction because I'm just going to lose it either way. So bidder zero strategy is in this two, two bidder auction is either pay more than the tip and win for free or pay less than the, uh, or, or don't bother bribing and just walk away from the auction. That's the equilibrium or that's an equilibrium of this game. Now what happens as a result of this equilibrium, consider the original honest equilibrium that would have been played if we were not trying to use the blockchain to run this auction. We were just doing it in real life. We'd have two bidders whose values were IID from uniform 01. That means that in an, in an uh, honest auction, the seller would make a profit, expected profit of a third, the expected second highest out of two uh, IID draws from uniform 01. Bidder zero would win the auction half the time because they're, they're symmetric with the other buyer, and they'd make an expected profit of a sixth. You can calculate that. What happens here instead is that buyer zero wins the auction way more often because they get sort of right of refusal by, by, uh, by this chance to censor the other bids. They make a higher expected surplus. Buyer one, of course, does worse, makes lower expected surplus, and the seller gets completely screwed. So the seller revenues here go to zero because there's always only one bid in the auction. Either bidder zero chose to censor, and, um, and, and in which case there was their bid, or they chose to walk away, in which case there was only the honest bidder's bid. Instead, the money from the auction is going to the proposer in terms of the tip or the bribe. And now you might ask, well, that was uh, sort of happening because there was a lot of, uh, there was only one bidder. What happens with n bidders? Maybe with n bidders, there's sort of safety in numbers that uh, each of these uh, people will be willing to tip enough that uh, the briber, uh, the bribing bidder does not find it profitable. And indeed, we show that that's not the case. So we show that the, basically that these tips are kind of like a collective security. At the time I'm choosing how much to tip as a bidder, I'm contributing to a public good, which is like the sort of total amount of tipping. But I don't know if I'm going to win the auction or not. So if there are a lot of bidders, I'm not willing to pay a lot because of a standard kind of public goods problem. And that means that the tips are low. Uh, bidder zero is going to continue to either buy out everyone it's, uh, we show that it's optimal for buyer zero to either buy out everyone or buy out no one. And indeed, what we show is that uh, tips are really low. Seller revenues collapse. So seller revenues continue to be very low, even when there are multiple bidders. And as an aside, we show that even if you try to run this seller revenues, uh, sorry, the tips are so low that even if you try to run this auction over multiple blocks, you would not restore the sort of desired outcome. So you would not restore, just because you were running it over multiple blocks, you would not get sufficient resist, uh, censorship resistance unless the auction ran over more blocks than there were number of bidders. So uh, that's a lot to take in, but uh, you can see the details in the paper. So that's uh, all uh, bad news. So what's the good news? Well, to the extent that you, uh, so we propose a slightly different a solution to trying to run um, auctions or mechanisms like that on a chain. And it's a bit of a heavy lift in terms of consensus, but here's the idea. We propose that you could use multiple concurrent block proposers. So instead of having one proposer within a single slot, you allow for multiple proposers within a single slot. And because there are multiple proposers within a single slot, you can allow for conditional tipping. That is to say that you can the tip can depend not just on whether or not 
uh, you were included by a proposer in that slot, but how many other proposers included your transaction within that slot? For simplicity, uh, for the sake of analysis, just think of two tips. So you have a, little, uh, a small tip little t and a large tip capital T. The small tip applies whenever one or more, uh, whenever more than one um, proposer includes your transaction in the block. The big tip capital T applies whenever uh, only one proposer includes your transaction. Now, what this does, this concurrent, um, what this does in terms of um, uh, what this does in terms of censorship resistance is that it makes the censorship resistance really large because the censorship resistance of the conditional tipping is straightforwardly k times the large number of capital T. In order to convince a proposer to censor the block, they, you have to be willing to, they understand that it's only worth it for you to take the transaction off if they've also, uh, if you've also removed, uh, if you've also paid all the other proposers. That means that at that point, their choice is, should I include the transaction and get large T, or not include the transaction and take your bribe? That means every proposer would want to pay, uh, would, would want to be paid cap T to censor the transaction. On the other hand, to inc they would include the transaction at the price of little t in equilibrium. A different way to say this is that with two or more concurrent proposers, what this conditional tipping does is it makes inclusion a prisoner's dilemma. It's really tempting for me if I think the other guy is not including the transaction to include the transaction and get the large tip capital T, but in equilibrium, both of us will include it and get the small tip uh, little t. And if you set up those little t and capital T parameters right, in equilibrium for any number of proposers larger than two, what you can do is you can set up the large tip capital T large so that uh, it's too expensive for bidder zero, the censoring bidder, to buy out the transactions. On the other hand, the small tip is what is actually paid out, and therefore all bidders pay zero or some small nuisance spam reducing uh, tip on path. This way what happens is twofold. One, the auction runs as desired because all the bids get included and um, they uh, function as desired. And secondly, because the on path tips are just zero, that means that um, because the on path tips are just zero, that means that the unlike the previous settings where uh, tips were increasing in bids and therefore tips were revealing bids, here the equilibrium tips don't reveal the bids. So in summary, um, sort of our punchline is that uh, running DeFi mechanisms on chain requires this sort of notion of censorship resistance, which is that it needs, uh, it, needs it to be expensive for uh, adversaries to keep stuff off chain. Otherwise, the profits from the mechanism will accrue to the proposer, limiting the value proposition of uh, running the mechanism in the first place. A subtle point that I didn't have time to get to, but hopefully is getting clear from uh, this line of work that Max also presented, is that PBS inherently creates a market for censorship. That is to say that inherently, because the block uh, the, the outcome is not determined by what's in the block, but just who's willing to pay the most for it. This, the PBS auction that, we descri that Max described in his paper um, essentially is setting up a market where the bidder zero can just bid more than what they think would be the price of the, uh, than, than the competing price, which is uh, the, the block constructed from all the valid bids. And there's an explicit mechanism now in our blockchain to actually do that. Using sequential blocks can get censorship resistance. So an easier, uh, easier solution to solving the censorship resistance problem is that you can just say, OK, run the mechanism over multiple blocks. But that's inherently slow and therefore not a great solution to a lot of the motivating questions I talked about earlier, for example, EPBS or MEV recapture or liquidation auctions. Um, a particular solution that we like is uh, multiple concurrent block proposers, 
This restores censorship resistance, but it's an engineering challenge and um, requires a large change to consensus. So with those thoughts, I'll stop here and take questions. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I uh, really appreciate it, especially as someone who doesn't normally understand a lot of the uh, game theory here. I guess I'm wondering about in the case where people are regularly offering a, a large tip, small tip scenario, will we see block proposers colluding to ensure that exactly one of them proposes the block, gets the bigger tip, and then they split it? And if they make a regular habit out of this, like if this is something they just do as a matter of course, does that interfere with the results here? So. Part one is yes, um, you could, it, it would, I mean, it could be an equilibrium for block proposers or, you know, block builders to collude. I would just submit that if you're worried about collusion uh, among block, I mean, we have bigger problems than, uh, you know, like all our mechanisms, everything we understand about the equilibrium of blockchains is based on these entities not playing the collusive equilibria. All of them, however, are repeated games and there are collusive equilibria. So I don't know why you would single this one out as the sort of thing that pushes us over the edge into a collusive equilibrium. Um, but yes, it is a concern. Very nice work, thank you. Um, just curious what would happen if uh, in, a, in a world where the children of an unincluded transaction could pay the, the fees for the parent. As in, you know, if I were to import that Bitcoin feature into Ethereum, how would your analysis change? I'm not sure. Max, do you want to take this? I, Max takes all the hard questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, we don't have an easy answer off the top of our head. We're happy to take this offline. Um, I will add that a lot of this is about time. Con like we're thinking about very instantaneous stuff. So like the children coming back later and paying for inclusion, um, it, it's probably too late because the auction is probably already conducted. But but maybe you meant something different. So I'll, I'll take it off with you after. So, you know, will the, say, seller giving some part of, you know, like, say, X percent of its revenue to the uh, proposer, mm -hmm. will that, you know, help at all in this dynamics or, or uh, does this result like kind of carry through even then? Um, it, I mean, it depends. Maybe if there was, like, if I thought the censorship problem was low, it might help align the problem. But here, I mean, look at the worst case was like the two block, uh, the two seller, two buyer case. And there, the seller was getting zero revenue in equilibrium anyway. So the proposer is already getting the entire sort of thing. There's nothing left that the seller can offer that would make this, um, that, would, that would you know bring back the proposer on the right side. So um, I, I guess part of the larger constraint, uh, some, of, some of you may have seen me at SBC and Max and Tivas walking around with end the proposer monopoly. Part of the original sin of this is that while we have these decentralized blockchains and we talk about their decentralization properties, at any one instant, the proposer has all the monopoly power. So you might be someone who has a unique good to sell and you are a monopolist in the economic sense for that. But if you're going through the blockchain, your monopoly is inherently gate kept by the proposer. And that, that monopoly rent and that monopoly distortion is what we need to think about how to mitigate. Okay, then thank you for your wonderful talk and you're welcome to uh, uh, just ask questions offline. And I think this is the end of the session. Thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>